Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, everybody. This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and we've got Renee from Acculution. I wanted to make sure I said that right. And um, basically, right. yeah, so Renee's been on here before. I'm sure you've all seen the video, and if you haven't, I'll try to remember to put a card up here. Um, Renee and I were talking over well, the past few months, I guess, and we've kicked around some ideas, and one of the ideas that I thought would be useful for people to get some scientific understanding of is beaming and radiation pattern of drive units, just the, the raw drive units. So Renee has put together some very in-depth package information for us and is going to walk through it and hopefully teach us like we're kindergartners because I did flip through it already and I was like, whoa, I remember doing that math, but nothing to that extent. So anyway, um, yeah, and with that said, Renee, I will let you take the floor. Anything you want to add or anything like that, and I'm just going to kind of help steer this steer this ship along a little bit, I guess. Thanks, Erin. Uh, good to be on here again. I, I'm sure you have some input to this too. Um, so let me just, uh, am I sharing or? Uh, yes, I, should be. I see it good. now. Okay, good. I will throw this up here for us. And yeah, you've got control, so you can, uh, yeah, you can take yeah. over for now. Thanks. Yeah, so the topic is uh, acoustic radiation. Uh, maybe not on complete speakers, but at least hopefully we get a little sense of what's going on uh, when it comes to radiation patterns and uh, things like that. Uh, just like last time, I have my own company. Uh, I work as a consultant looking very much into transducers. Uh, I have some students that I work with that are looking at many different things, optimization and vibroacoustics. So I try to uh, sort of combine academia and, and industry work to come up with some good engineering solutions. Um, yeah, so these are the topics that uh, we'll run through. You can see that I've grayed out one topic. It just became too much to include, but the, the vibration of a, a, a real loudspeaker with flexible or elastic parts. That's a very complex uh, topic. So we'll just briefly run through it, but uh, don't expect too much from that. But I will sh uh, show some issues with uh, single drivers and multiple drivers playing in the same frequency range and how different crossovers will affect radiation pattern. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to start is to look at a piston of radiator in a, an infinite baffle. So it's a flat baffle. It extends to infinity in all directions. Um, so that takes out the uh, diffraction from the cabinet. I, I'm very much into splitting uh, effects uh, uh, or isolating different effects. Um, and then looking at a flat piston or, or radiator. The uh, shape of the radiator can be anything. It can actually be several uh, separated uh, surfaces. But if you know the surface and you can sort of express it mathematically, and if you also know uh, the vibration in all points on that surface, and you can also express that somehow, you can find the pressure uh, with phase in any point you want to, near field, far field, whatever. Uh, so, it, so you can actually solve this in, in a simulation software, or you can typically build it yourself if you want to in MATLAB. For what we're trying to do, I think it's better to limit ourselves so that we are not doing any numerical calculations. We want some closed form uh, expression that we could plug into Excel or something like that and get uh, a feel for how things uh, are radiating. Um, a lot of what I show you could show in Excel or something like that. So the way to limit ourselves is to uh, not have an arbitrary shaped piston, but go for something like circular or rectangular. Um, in that case, we can solve the integration much easier. And also, we look at a, a true piston. Everything is moving in, in unison on the, on the driver. That's what I call a single phase displacement. Uh, so the, the phase of the displacement is the same uh, along the, the radiating surface. Uh, 
if we limit ourselves to that situation, we can come up with uh, two expressions. Uh, one works in far field. So that's what I'm trying to illustrate here with the green annular thingy here. As long as we are like a couple of radii or diameters away uh, from the piston, we have a, a very good uh, expression for what goes on uh, both on axis and off axis. Um, whereas if we are limiting ourselves to on axis, we can actually find another expression that gives us uh, the point or the pressure in any point on axis. Uh, knowing those two uh, is really good if you work with loud speakers. It's a quick way to assess if your simulations are somewhat uh, correct, at least order of magnitude correct. Uh, just compare it to a circular piston. Um, we can see in the far field that we have this uh, angle dependency, and that's what we are looking for in uh, in our discussion here. So the on-axis pressure is more to uh, validate uh, some of the setup that we do later on. But for now, we'll just look at the, the far field expression here, and we can see that since this fraction is the only place uh, where the, the angle uh, relative to on axis uh, is there. We can compact all of the rest into uh, an on axis uh, pressure that that gives us the sort of the magnitude, uh, and then everything uh, off axis is relative to that. Um, so that's a, a simpler way to write it. And then we get this angle dependency, uh, and this J one is a Bessel function. It's not super important for what we are discussing here, but at least you need to be able to plot uh, a, a Bessel function like that. So we can see already that there's some dependency related to frequency. So we don't have the same radiation pattern uh, at different frequencies. The uh, diameter uh, or radius of the piston also goes into that. Uh, so that also affects things. Um, and then we, of course, have the angle. So there are these three uh, variables to consider. So we could jump straight into just plotting that angle uh, dependency. You would get some curves and you could say, well, if this is our expression, we'll have to trust uh, these plots. But I think we should look more into what's the physics behind this. Why do we even get these uh, polar plots? So first we can look at what's the sort of simplest way we could look at it, and that would probably be a number. So instead of looking at plots, we get a sort of zero dimensional number uh, per frequency that tells us how directive is our uh, radiator. And you could come up with different metrics for this, actually. I think the typical one is this one where uh, we define a directivity which basically looks at how much uh, of the intensity goes on axis compared to what's the average intensity for a omnipolar uh, source with the same emitted sound power. Um, so if, if, if all of this sound power was not directed in any particular direction, but in all directions, uh, what we, would we then get? And then we can compare those two numbers. So the more directive it is, the higher the number, and we get this number per frequency. This number can be very high uh, as we go, as we'll see later, as we go to higher and higher frequencies. So it's good to have more of a level or a directivity index where we take the logarithm that keeps the number uh, reasonably low still, uh, and we multiply by 10. Uh, because we know the angular dependency, we can calculate uh, this directivity analytically. And we can see we're still carrying around a Bessel function, but the, the angle is now taken out. So now we have an expression per frequency uh, and also for different uh, radii that we can plug into and see what is the directivity index. And this is a plot that you, Aaron, very often have, maybe always, um, in, in your uh, plots. I think you scale it up so that it's not disappearing uh, way too low. 
right. and again, you can you can scale it in different ways. You could come up with different ways of defining it. But in this case, directivity is two at low frequencies. That's because we're radiating into half space and we are comparing to what if we radiated into full space. So we are we are carrying this factor of two. That's fine. Uh, we could take that out if we wanted to. And when we then take the logarithm multiply by 10, we get uh, the number three. So that's our the number that falls out of this expression at low frequencies. And then we can see at higher and higher frequencies, the driver or the radiation becomes more directive. Um, and it scales with frequency squared, we can see. Uh, so we get this upward uh, second order slope. Um, so that's good that you 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 have a number. Uh, it's a simple way to look at it, but we see we've lost a lot of information as to how does it actually look off axis. So that's mm. kind of the cost uh, of doing it that way, um, but but still good to have. Um, yeah. So so uh, the the typical measurement, the most important measurement, is typically the on axis pressure. Um, so we will first look at what is that for a circular piston uh, moving um, as a piston. Everything is moving the same. And then compare that to uh, off axis and what, what happens there. Uh, last time we talked about what really drives sound pressure is acceleration. That's what you should be thinking. Um, and I have applied a constant acceleration in my expression. And then I get this uh, on axis pressure for a eight, eight inch diameter, uh, one meter distance. Um, and so I said a flat acceleration gives us a flat uh, sound pressure, which we can see is only true to a certain uh, frequency. And then we have a drop off. So one approach could just be to say, well, it's at, uh, I think, 68 kilohertz or something. So we can just ignore that it's not important. We built loudspeakers. Who cares? But for what we are doing, uh, it, it's important to figure out why that is. Why do we see this uh, dip? Um, no matter, you could say, how small we make uh, the radiator, we'll, we'll see this dip somewhere in the frequency range. Um, so why isn't it just flat? So the issue is related to um, the piston always having some extension physically in space. There is some finite uh, diameter. Um, and because of that, in no matter where, which point we select as our microphone point, unless we go uh, extremely far away, um, we will have a relative uh, distance difference. Uh, looking from a microphone point down on several points on the piston, we will see different distances down there. So very often we, we think about measuring in like one meter distance, but it's a bit of a misnomer because there is no one meter. Uh, well, maybe there are at some points, um, but it becomes a little squirrely, uh, especially at higher frequencies. What is the distance? So I think I calculated here that for the eight inch, uh, inch uh, driver, we'll have around 0.2 inches in difference, uh, the maximum difference between two points, uh, or at least uh, from on X or midpoint to outer edge. So the, the, there is a difference in distance. Uh, one other thing to consider is that all of those points on the edge in total represent a larger area. And that's also important, uh, we'll see later on. So the, the issue with having a, a distance difference is that the sound propagates with uh, a certain velocity. So it takes time for, for the sound to uh, emit from the piston and then reach the, the microphone point. And it takes different uh times for for different distances traveled and so there are different face uh faces related to to each point down here and as we go to higher and higher frequencies we get smaller and smaller wavelengths so small differences in 
in distance can represent a fairly large uh, phase difference. And that's really what's going on uh, here. So one good way uh, to illustrate this, instead of just saying this falls out of the equations, is actually uh, what I also talked a little about last time, uh, which is phase decomposition. I've written about this clip has some very good work on on that. It's it's uh, it's inspired from from Clipper, but I do it in the simulation software. Um, so the idea is that instead of looking at total dis displacement of the piston and whatever resulting pressure you have in a microphone point, you decompose uh, those total values into uh, different components, and uh, hopefully it will be clear. Uh, soon what those are. So we have two different uh, pressure components and one is called in-phase and the other one is called anti-phase. So they are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, but they are abstract. What we have is a total phase, but we can still decompose into these abstract uh, pressures. Um, and since they are completely out of phase uh, with each other, where the two curves meet, we'll have a zero in total uh, output because the, the two components completely cancel out. So where do these pressures come from? Um, this should actually animate. I don't know why it's not animating. Strange. Um, you had to click on it? Yeah. Hey, I, I think I shouldn't have to, but that worked. Thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, as opposed to the uh, components or the pressure components, we have three uh, displacement components. So the idea is that you are looking from a, a measurement point or a microphone point. It could be anywhere, but you select a, a microphone point. Uh, in that microphone point, you have a complex uh, sound pressure, meaning you have uh, information about magnitude, but also about phase. So you look down from that point onto each point on the vibrating surface and take into account the distance to each point and the displacement phase in each point. And then you see how did that, uh, how do all of these small vibrations contribute to the pressure that I'm experiencing in that point. And so you can decompose into part of the displacement that actually contributes in phase uh, to that pressure phase. There's a component that's in anti-phase, so that actually subtracts from the total uh, pressure. And then you have quadrature uh, displacement, and that, that doesn't have its own uh, sound pressure level because it doesn't generate any sound pressure. It's 90 degrees out of phase with these two. So it's just, uh, it shows inefficiency. If you have a lot of quadrature movement, you have a lot of movement that doesn't go into generating the pressure. So that's really where it comes from. So with that technique, uh, we can now uh, look from uh, our on-axis point once more one meter distance, but at different frequencies. So we have a blue point here uh, at 100 Hertz. We have a total sound pressure level, which is the same as our in-phase sound pressure level. And that fits with what we are visualizing here, that we have a total displacement and that's seen as a complete in-phase uh, displacement at these low frequencies. Everything is from the point we are observing in, everything is seen to have sort of the same distance. And uh, it also has the same phase because the total displacement has the same phase all over. So at lower frequencies, we see nothing uh, particular interesting. Um, when we go to higher frequencies, we can actually in the curve see a slight roll off. It's not super significant, but we can see it uh, in the pressure level. So here we are around five kilohertz, still on axis. And we can see some of the total displacement is actually in quadrature. Now we have these uh, 
issues showing up already with uh, different distances seen from the point, uh, the microphone point. Um, mm. That all in all gives us some displacement that isn't really contributing. And, and in some sense, we are getting a, a smaller area uh, that radiates sound. Yeah, I can see. And just for those who are looking back at this, it took me a second to realize, but your uh, your top right end phase, you can actually see that the lighter color is moving out of sync with the yeah, darker yeah. portion it, around it. It's really a plot where you need to sit with it yourself and uh, dissect it, uh, cut it. But then you will see that uh, those two add up to the total. That will always be the case, mm -hmm. that the, the total displacement is the sum of these three. Maybe I should also say that looking at one point on the uh, uh, piston, that one point or each point in itself can only be in two of these. It can't be in phase and anti phase at the same time, which I think makes uh, sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, going to higher frequencies, we, we realized the situation with wavelengths being smaller. So, distance differences will be more pronounced. We see a slight roll off. Uh, maybe you wouldn't be too concerned on axis with that. But at least when we decompose, we can see that total movement is now more and more in quadrature. It's just not as efficient uh, as at, uh, at lower frequencies. And finally, if we go directly to the dip uh, or complete cancellation at 68 kilohertz, and I know that's very high, but this illustrate, uh, illustrates the, the principle of why we get these dips. Uh, we see that we have a lot of quadrature uh, displacement and whatever in-phase displacement we do have is cancelled out by this anti-phase uh, ring here. And there are some textbooks that somewhat allude to this, that you have these rings. They typically only say that, that there's in-phase and anti-phase, and there, there's a very sharp line between the two. Uh, that's not true. Uh, this is what's going on here. You wouldn't expect anything sharp uh, changing as you smoothly uh, traverse this piston, unless the displacement it, itself uh, could be very erratic, but here it's very smooth. Um, so this is the way to, to view it, or one way to view it at least. And so now we can go back to our polar pattern that we had before. And we, we see the same thing, uh, but now we also look uh, on axis. So, at 100 hertz, we have this blue dot. We have the blue line here, um, and it's it's very omnidirectional. Uh, there isn't a particular angle where it radiates more intensely. Um, and if we go to five kilohertz, the green one on axis, as we saw before, we don't really notice anything. Uh, there's a slight quadrature movement but go on, off axis. And now you suddenly see these lobes. You have some uh, cancellations at uh, some particular angles. And as you go to higher and higher frequencies, you see more and more directed sound uh, forward. And it's the, again the same thing. Uh, the distance differences play a role, uh, make the piston smaller, and you can offset this uh, to a in some sense to any degree you want, but when you have a finite uh, diameter, then you will see something like this. And we can also see right at the dip, if we zoom in that we actually have a dip on axis, yeah. uh, but we have a little sound off axis, but it's, it's very much directed uh, forward. Mm -hmm. Um. And there's nothing stopping us from uh, doing phase de decomposition uh, at another angle. So if we ch choose 45 degrees, and then we look uh, still one meter away, but at 45 degrees, um, then we can see that uh, at five kilohertz, we do have some output. I think it says 20, it's somewhat arbit arbitrary. 
but it's it's quite low. Mm -hmm. um, and if we look at the the lobe for five kilohertz, it's green, so it's a little difficult to see. We hit the twenty dB around there, so we can see we're close to a a, a null. Uh, uh, at that angle, we could go a little further and then have very little sound. Uh, if we if we look at the uh, total pressure, we, we now see a lot of peaks because, uh, sorry, dips, because off axis, these differences become much more pronounced. And also, if we go very close to the piston, we have very large relative uh, uh, differences in, in distance. Uh, but even here, if we go off axis, we see a large degree of uh, quadrature, uh, some in phase, a little more than anti phase. So, all in all, we do get some sound pressure, but we have a roll off at a, a much lower uh, frequency than before. So, hopefully, those three uh, overviews uh, fit together. Um, there, of course, um, different ways to uh, plot this. You can look at uh, one plane, like horizontal plane or vertical plane, which are typically the to two most important ones, and then plot uh, per frequency and then also per angle. So the color uh, gives us the sound pressure level. There are different ways you can normalize this uh, if you have a very flat on axis, there's not much difference between normalizing or not, but you could normalize for each frequency uh, so that on axis you would always have a flat response. And uh, maybe Aaron, you can talk more about that. Um, and, and you can view directivity uh, like that. Uh, I like your globe plots actually, Aaron which is basically the same thing, but it's sort of more wrapped around in a natural uh, circle, uh, looking at the pattern that way. Mm -hmm. Again, you can normalize that different ways. Um, and then you can also look sort of per frequency, but at two different angles at once, if you want that. So uh, yeah, that that's probably somewhat what you get used to looking at. I would say I really don't look much at, at these types of plots, but uh, that's uh, how you can do it. So uh, we have looked at a flat piston and typically drivers are not flat, sometimes they are. Um, and I had this plan about showing some cone pistons and then letting them be elastic. Uh, as I said, that's a little too much work uh, <laughs> for, for today. But at least if we cone the piston, we see a much uh, earlier drop off uh, at an earlier frequency or lower frequency than a flat piston. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that makes sense from what we just talked about, because now you get uh, more severe distances, or right, dif yeah. differences in this relative distance from like yeah. the center, maybe further away than well, yeah. maybe not further, but it's going to be different. Yes. You know? as you and go further so, out to the edge. Yes, for sure. And if it is elastic or if it is a real driver and it's very deep, well, each point is not going to move like a piston. It's not a single phase displacement. So you have difference in distance and you have difference in phase, displacement phase. Mm -hmm. um, but so this is just to illustrate that our ideal uh, flat piston is different from what you would usually observe um but again the principle is the same uh, we we can do a similar analysis and one thing i, I just want to note is that i have this green line it's probably very difficult to see but at low frequencies we have the same output as before and that may not be so intuitive because we should have a much larger area and so i just put down here that that is because we still apply like a axial velocity so it's still moving up and down compared to our on axis but what really drives sound is not this axial velocity we should, should actually say acceleration but it's the normal velocity so we have a normal that's 90 degrees to the piston 
so as we angle the uh, or make it more and more uh, coned, mm -hmm. we do get more and more area, but the normal velocity or ac acceleration also goes down accordingly. So we don't get any more output from that. Um, other than that, it uh, it's uh, fairly complex, and we'll have a short look at what's going on when when we have an elastic cone. But you could say now, why don't we just have flat pistons? It looks like they are superior. Um, that's, of course, because we can't guarantee a pistonic movement. We have a former that grabs on to uh, uh, sort of the inner uh, boundary of the cone. And then on the outside, we have a surround. So we are not controlling the entire uh, cone as such. Um, and also having flat pistons can be problematic in itself because, as I illustrate here, they don't have a much they, they don't have a lot of stiffness, uh, uh, bending stiffness. So I, I put a piece of paper here on my desk, and it just folds over uh, due to gra gravity. But if you put it into a cone shape, which I think is a good exercise, mm -hmm. you'll see that it gets a lot of uh, geometric stiffness. So Putting it together like a comb will, will make it more stiff. And uh, if if you look at the modes uh, for a cone-shaped piston versus a flat one, you'll see the flat one has all kinds of low frequency modes, the very classical modes that you can look up in uh, in textbooks. Whereas as soon as you make it into a cone, those trivial or low frequency modes are just gone get much more complex uh, modes at a higher frequency. So that's sort of a, a little reasoning as to why we don't have that many flat pistons. Uh, and again, so the, the compromise that we have is cone shape, uh, typically flared somewhat uh, on, the, on the edge, and then we have elastic parts. So there's a Young's modulus and a Poisson ratio and all of that. Um, and things only move as pistons at, at lower frequencies. And then you have modal behavior uh, at higher frequencies. Um, and you can you can do that numerically and, and investigate that numerically. So when we have a, um, a real loudspeaker, we'll, we'll have um, a type of displacement that is not pistonic. So each point has its own displacement phase. Uh, we have some distance differences uh, also. So it's a, a more complex analysis. Um, we can still uh, do our calculations. We can, uh, all of the plots that we saw before, we can make those. So here I made uh, a polar plot uh, of a driver I once made. Uh, and again, at different frequencies, you can see what that pattern is and how it gets more and more directive uh, along the uh, on axis. So uh, that's no issue. And we can also within reason, if it's not too coned, if it's fairly flat, um, we can still apply phase decomposition. And uh, that's really a, a, a nice feature because if you do have some peaks, for example, uh, and all you have is total pressure, you don't have much information as to why that is. Uh, you just have this outcome. But if you apply phase decomposition, you can see perhaps like here that what, what's really driving the sound is the surround and a lot of the mm -hmm. rest of the displacement is really in quadrature. So this is a, a dip in radiation efficiency, you could say, and some redesign should probably uh, be made. So it's a very nice tool to have. Well, uh, and, and this, going yeah. going back to the one you just showed, what is that? Probably like a six inch driver, give or take, uh, maybe a little bit larger. I think so. Eight. Yeah, around there. Yeah, six yeah, because that's think. yeah. So that's very very common, even in some of the more expensive drivers. And to see that yeah. dip, and then usually what you can do is you can just do an impedance sweep, and you can see a little blip in the impedance mm. right around that frequency. Um, so yeah. I, I think that's a, a really good example that you've chosen because a lot of DIYers out there probably see that go. I've seen that exact same thing before many yeah. times. So, uh, 
you can you can also see sort of a, a shelving uh, curve sometimes where if if that's the outcome you get that's what you get but figuring out how uh how maybe the cone is uh having a, an impedance mismatch with the surround or what's going on there's there's some uh change in efficiency uh and again phase decomposition could probably help out there so you can see all sorts of strange uh responses sometimes mm. um this one is just for the elastic cone and really why i didn't want to go into too much detail uh about that even looking at the cone on its own no other parts no surround no nothing you uh, you are in for a treat when it comes to the mathematics of uh, mechanical admittance and uh, solving these uh, shell uh, equations so i think that's a little uh, too much for today um but i think that's kind of kind of interesting though is it shows just how much engineering like legitimate engineering goes into creating a good driver yeah. because a lot of times when you purchase a, a cheap just a i don't know i guess the best way to put it is just a cheap driver you can assume that there's probably not a lot of overhead costs that went into that man hours analysis time engineering etc so you're going to wind up with a poor performer and hopefully when you're paying for something more expensive you're paying for that engineering expertise and a better design yeah and 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 studying all of this and and uh, many other things you you should study uh like crossover uh, uh, mathematics and things mm. will hopefully uh enable you to boil some of or a lot of this down to some rules of thumb and uh, it's better to have them based on some uh, uh foundation foundational knowledge than just trial and error i would think so I would uh, think, yeah. yeah the amount of time of trial and error would be large yeah just for yeah. lack of a better word yeah so uh but yeah you can have different approaches to this um and here it's just to mention you can make it even more complex because if if your cone is not uh isotropic and it's not homogeneous meaning it can change its material parameters from point to point and in each point it looks different in different directions uh you can have cases like this where this is working with composite sound you can go check it out on the home page uh trying to control modal behavior at, at higher frequencies and distribute modes uh, so that they don't necessarily result in uh, uh, resonances um that's uh, also fairly complex but uh, let's also skip that for now um so i thought maybe a little simpler thing could be to just uh what should i look for when i i see a driver um hopefully now it should be clear that the smaller we, we make a driver the less of these relative distance differences we see so it's it's going to be more omnidirectional mm -hmm. but we can also expand that knowledge into what if it's high but still uh, slim in horizontal direction so if it's 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 small in horizontal direction it means that it will probably have a wide dispersion in horizontal uh, plane and i've seen people flip that around they think well there's so much there's so much area in in vertical direction it must be very good at uh, radiating sound vertically but hopefully from what we have seen you will now have large uh, distance differences uh, these two curves don't relate to this speaker uh, but it's it's just to illustrate uh, the point here and so if it's wide in wide and tall you know we have this uh, more like a sweet spot that you need to be in because it's now more beamy uh, so right. perhaps that uh, tells us something um, in a more simple manner mm -hmm. uh, that way of thinking of it i think could be applied to uh, uh, center speakers you mentioned a lot of center speakers recently and they seem to have shifted uh, many of them uh, are either coaxial now 
or they are placed uh, like this. Um, so here we have uh, a tweeter and a, a mid, and the issue is that there will be a region, a frequency region, where they are uh, both contributing. So you could uh, imagine uh, taking them uh, very much apart, you'll have these uh, distance differences, and uh, that can give you some issue. Um, here they're placed on top of each other. So looking back on this one, we can think of this as being like a little taller, but still slim. And we can see that's probably the better compromise than having uh, the tweeter on the side, uh, because if it's slim in horizontal uh, uh, direction, it's going to have a wider uh, horizontal dispersion. And that's probably more important. You can sit uh, in different places in the sofa as long as you're on the same uh, height level, all of you. Uh, this is this is probably the better way to lay out uh, your center speaker. Um, yeah, then, then there's another issue, and that is uh, if you have these two different uh, drivers, for these two, it's probably not uh, so much of an issue. But if you look at the mid and, and the, then the woofers on the side, the smaller uh, drivers typically also sit a little further uh, ahead. Uh, whereas the bigger drivers sit further into the um, enclosure, uh, typically. So uh, there, there is what's often called time alignment. Uh, again, if there is a larger distance for the sound to travel, yes, there is a time difference. But I think it should be called distance alignment because I think people conflate things and think as long as I align the drivers, Everything is going to be fine. Uh, no temporal issues, no issue with time and phase. Uh, and I think this is from Wikipedia. And you see them illustrating it as as long as you uh, either do a, it should say linear phase shift or a time uh, correction on the tweeter so that it gets the signal later uh, to compensate for the woofer sitting behind it you'll get this nice lobe. Um, and there's more to it than that. So uh, another approach is to physically move the, the tweeter backwards or tilt the whole driver. But those two situations and this situation are really three different ones because the uh, uh, diffraction patterns are going to be different. So th there the are many moving parts here. Um, but what's not considered is the driver and crossover phase in all of that. Um, and also one thing I write here, we're lucky in acoustics to not have dispersion. And oftentimes we talk about dispersion as how, how does it radiate? But dispersion is really, um, do we have a difference in propagation speed at different frequencies? So in acoustics, we just say, uh, 340 meters per second, uh, that's our sound speed. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't fly in a lot of uh, optics, for example. There you can have different uh, propagation speeds per frequency. Um, so, so we're a little lucky here in, in acoustics. Um, so I, I wanted to illustrate uh, this point about the lobes uh, at the crossover frequencies where two drivers are splitting the work. Um, so first I have uh, the driver here. It's just flat pistons and they are ideal drivers. So the frequency response comes completely from the crossover. Uh, and again, this is to split out uh, the different effects. So uh, you could add the driver characteristics later on uh, if you want to. So here I have a Linquist Riley second order um, crossover on the two drivers here. Um, and that is uh, interesting in the fact that the face of each of those uh, crossover parts uh, is the same. Uh, it's also the same as the total face. Um, and that makes it so that uh, our lobing here is symmetrical. There's no uh, difference uh, 
going up versus down. On axis, we get our expected flat uh, response. Um, and as long as we sort of sit not too high and not too low, we don't have any issues as such. Uh, at, at lower frequencies, the, the low or the directivity is governed by the larger piston. At high frequencies, it comes from, from the tweeter. And here in between, we also have a very nice lobe. And we can also visualize the pressure uh, on the right here. And we see, we see the same thing. Um, if we don't have the distance alignment, uh, we have some issue. Um, and I have made a, a time delay to the woofer. Instead of redrawing the geometry, I just put a delay on the woofer uh, to emulate that it, it sits further back into the enclosure. Um, and now we can see uh, at the crossover frequency, even though it's the same crossover, it, it looks like uh, the whole driver has been, or the whole cabinet has been tilted forward, which makes sense because the, the, the woofer in some sense sits further back. Uh, and here we'll have a loping that, uh, that goes up and down uh, with frequency. It stays on axis and then around the, Crossover frequency, it dips down, and then the higher frequencies, it comes up again. And we'll have a dip um, on axis because we don't have this uh, time delay. So we should put a time delay on the tweeter as illustrated uh, previously. And we mm -hmm. can again see this issue um, in the field. But there's a little more to it because we have chosen a crossover that has uh, I think in hi-fi uh, circles, it co it's called uh, phase coherent um, uh, crossover. Uh, I don't think phase coherent is a signal processing term that you'll find in textbooks. Um, and and, and uh, going back to the, the Linquist Riley, it's not a linear phase. Uh, so there is some, it's, it's not transient perfect, uh, you can say, but the, the two phases for the two sections are the same. Uh, and that's what's important. If we take another uh, configuration of a filter or crossover, like the Butterworth third order uh, I took here, and we, we take away the, the time delay. So everything is distance aligned now. We see that on axis, we will get the correct uh, sound pressure level uh, around here. Um, and we'll actually get the same face as before. And we can talk on a separate video about crossovers if anyone is interested in why that is. I but think it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's not obvious that you have two different orders for the filters, but you get the same response. Uh, but now we have an issue, and it's probably more severe than before. Because if, if you poke your head up, you're sitting, <clears throat> sorry, you're sitting too high, you're going to get a dip. Uh, uh, around the frequent or the crossover frequency, and if you set too low, you're gonna get I think three dB too high. Uh, so you get a lift uh, in output, um, and it looks to be very sensitive. There's a lot of change for a small uh, angle here. So this is just to illustrate: it's not enough to do time alignment or, or distance alignment. Uh, you you need to look at the the resulting uh, radiation pattern, and of course, if you have multiple uh, multi-way, like three-way or four-way, you need to have these considerations. Uh, maybe so not so much for the lower frequencies, but at least here, and this will all be affected by um, enclosure, uh, the crossover frequency, how close are the two drivers to each other and, and things like that. But uh, what we have illustrated here is that before you build anything, you could try out these things uh, fairly easily. It's not too difficult to try uh, or to input these different uh, crossover uh, topologies or transfer functions. And perhaps you also have some TL small parameters. Perhaps you also have the cone geometry. So you could do it in steps and look at a uh, polar pattern uh, before building anything. And uh, mm. that would be my way of doing it. Um, 
this one is just uh, what I said last time. I've gotten some comments about how it can't be that the, the uh, loudspeaker works the way I said, but the way to think about a loudspeaker isn't that the comb pushes outwards and then pressurizes the air in front of it. So you get a high pressure when it moves out. It moves out and comes to a stop. The particles near the driver also come to a stop, but further out in the bulk, the last they heard, they were move, moving outwards. So they are moving away and particles that split away from each other is the same as a low pressure. So uh, this is the way to think about it. And the reason that you can have a long career uh, building loudspeakers, not realizing it, this is if you only do measurements, you're always relating pressure back to voltage. So you kind of circumvent the whole uh, coupling and transductions principle. But if you uh, do simulations, you see all of the mechanics uh, at play. So uh, yeah, just a little comment uh, on that. Um, I think that is it. And I mentioned here that if, if this is of interest to anyone, we can do more of these. Uh, I've actually listed some here and I would say they are pretty much prioritized. I think mm -hmm. phase uh, is very uh, widely misunderstood uh, and we could tackle all of this with uh, minimum phase, what's linear phase, uh, how does polarity and phase relate, uh, and maybe most importantly, what is it with phase and time? Uh, is it the same or how is it related? Uh, and another one is room mode, uh, which is often also not quite uh explained the way i would prefer it and uh yeah the list uh could go on and you can It'll suggest things well as uh, you were talking i was actually writing some ideas down so i'll i'll be able to add to that list um no, i think that's really good so one thing that i've seen a lot of people uh, I, I guess misunderstand is okay so i'm not sure how to put this in a word <laughs> Uh, when, when people say, what's the beaming point here? I'm going to blow this back up for a second. When people talk about the beaming point of a driver, they often assume like just a single wavelength and you'll say the speed of sound divided by the driver diameter and that gets you in the ballpark, mm -hmm. but you can go to manufacturers websites like ScanSpeak or anybody who shows on and off access data. Yeah. Um, voice Coil magazine has that. And then you can say, well, that's not really correct. It's at least, you know, an octave lower. So it's at least like half a wavelength. But then I brought that up on one of the forums and Tom Danley corrected me and he said, well, actually it's a quarter wavelength. And then he explained why. And I said, that makes perfect sense. And then that kind of bleeds into why his designs are the way that they are, because he can physically place those drivers, you know, within that synergy horn type design within yeah. a quarter wavelength. But for most people using baffles, that's not physically possible. The drivers themselves are just not going to allow you to put them that close. So then yeah. you're like, you're like half a wavelength. So that's kind of what I generally use. Um, but I I wanted to have you on to explain and, and to give these diagrams of, you know, what's actually going on when we talk about combing and beaming and, and those kind of things. So I think what you've presented yeah. here is really, really quite useful. And I, I imagine, I think you also look at, at the crossover point, what happens at the, for the directivity index, because now you're uh, passing on to a much smaller the diameter right. radiator yeah that's right. more uh, omnipolar so what's going on there right. uh, and that's why to some degree that horns can be or waveguides i should say can be of interest also so uh, yeah. and what's your entire philosophy do you want it do you want a lot of side wall reflection exactly uh, exactly um, and, so. uh, and that's something that i i like i would like to do a video on at some point you know and, and just yeah. Not from like an expertise standpoint, but just a generic, you know, end user. I bought this speaker and, you know, everybody else says it's good, but I don't like it. Well, let's talk about why. And, and there's one reason why maybe it's a narrow design and you like it wider or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I think that's that to me is a more interesting aspect of kind of what we're doing is try to relate the things that maybe haven't been quite studied in full yet, or at least that I'm yeah. aware of. And, and maybe what? just kind of have that open discourse. 
yeah, one thing that we have talked about, which could be really neat, is to take all of that clipple data that you generate, extract those multiple uh, sources. If you could put mm -hmm. them into a software, and then you could see with some different treatment on your room, how is this going to perform in room? Because right. you have the information about directivity. So, right. Uh, yeah. That's very true. Well, and then and then there's that aspect, like you mentioned, the, the absorption panels and things like that. You know, some people, there may be speakers that are great other than a high frequency where it's a little bit more omnidirectional at higher frequencies. Yeah. So maybe you want to capture some of that, you know, so there's not so much energy spread to the sidewalls at the higher frequencies. And then you've got a perfect speaker with width in the sound stage and all these other attributes that you may you may want yeah. without the ones that you don't, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have a question for you, and yeah. I think we've got about maybe 15 minutes or so. So I think you've done a really good job also of kind of explaining. When we talk about loudspeakers, we I think pretty much everybody understands that there's trade-offs inherent in the design. Uh, you know, size, price, polar pattern, directivity, uh, response. Can you EQ it? Can you not EQ it? Will you need to EQ it? You know, mm -hmm. are you likely to have EQ? Like hi-fi, people aren't likely to have EQ, so you probably want a more linear on and off access speaker. But with home audio, where you're using, well, with home theater, where you're using EQ, it doesn't necessarily have to be linear. As long as you can shape it well, then you're okay, right? I mean, yeah. that's within reason. Yeah. Um, so those are the trade-offs in the actual use of a speaker. But I think you've also done a really good job of highlighting that even from the engineering side, there's certainly trade-offs in designing a raw transducer. So I'm curious. Oh yeah. Have you come across, do you think, cause I don't think there will ever be a perfect speaker. Do you think that there will ever be a perfect transducer? You know, and I, that's kind of a, a tricky question, but we talk about modes and things like that. I mean, is it possible to build a transducer that pushes modes so far above the audible range that you don't care about that? You don't have to worry about building a notch filter or you don't have to worry about where you place your crossover other than just, the direction matching i think some of the work we're doing with composite sound is very much related to that and it's not so much that you don't have modes it's more uh, if they lead to resonances so okay. modes uh, exist independently of forcing or source they are yeah. there no matter what mm -hmm. and you can distribute them and they have different uh, shapes um, and they can be there, but they can be very poor sound radiators, so you don't see them. Um, so that could be one way. When you say push them higher, that's not necessarily what you want to do. Uh, it's okay. just how do they radiate sound and how are they excited? Um, like, like push them down and level then, I guess, or spread them out? Is yeah. Uh, or uh, you could have a cone that has a large displacement related to a mode, but all in all, it's not, as we saw, you could have that being very much quadrature displacement so mm -hmm. that it doesn't radiate a lot of sound. And okay. that's difficult to do with a, a traditional driver where everything is just symmetrical uh, and, and in each direction you look, the uh, material is the same. So there you just go for stiffness. Uh, the, the stiffer it is, the more you can push it upwards. But if you can distribute the modes differently, via some uh, distribution of materials, then uh, then there's something to it. Um, and then also play around with losses because losses can be what dampens out a resonance also. Um, so perfect, uh, I don't know if anything is perfect, yeah. but more like designing the driver more strictly. So it is very close to what you set out to have. It makes everything after that much easier, like crossover design and things like that. If you could yeah. control the roll off and then incorporate that into being part of the total crossover. So the electronics is one half and your driver is one other half. And in total, you get a Linkwist Riley or whatever. Uh, right. That could be very neat. Um, and looking at your measurements, it's very often, or sometimes, 
it's very erratic and you can see it it can't always it can't all be related to crossover it, it's the drivers themselves that are very erratic mm -hmm. and that's that's uh, tricky to uh, once it's built and there uh, it's tricky to fix uh, that uh, so maybe more pre-studies and more analytical and numerical work could lead to a faster uh, development in the end of better yeah. drivers because some of them look almost uh, defective sometimes <laughs> yeah well that's the thing too is that when you have like a resonance like you were showing the lobing effects yeah and when you have that we saw that you may not have that on axis but you have it off axis and mm -hmm. when it shows up in the total sound power you can't just eq it down because it affects the different axes differently you know like it's yeah, not there yeah. in this axis but it's here in the other so you yeah. can't just you know you can't just say i'm going to cut it out with an eq because you're still only thing you're doing is just changing the spl right you still have that issue you're just changing yeah, the spl the, at that angle the, the physics is the same so the breakup is the same you're you're just controlling per frequency i want less or more but the radiation pattern is the same so there's only so much you can do once the drivers are built um well and and the other thing too i think you were kind of hinting at this is once the speaker's built and put into the cabinet you know you you're using crossover the manufacturers most of the stuff especially the budget in it stuff they're not going to be able to a pay for a, a really good driver and b mm. pay for a really good crossover to mitigate the issues with that driver so now you've got driver resonances and then you've got a crossover that doesn't help dampen those down. You know, it doesn't yeah. attenuate those enough. So like you said, then they show up in the in the measurements and it's at a frequency where it doesn't make sense that it would be anything other than a, a cone resonance of some sort. Mm. Yeah, and that's what you see sometimes that after the crossover point, you see some kind of lift yeah. again, but it's coming from the mid woofer because it has some uncontrolled uh, breakup that that is just there and you would need very steep uh, crossovers right. so getting it right from the beginning uh, that's that's a good way to work if you can and it's not going to be cheap probably yeah probably not but uh, probably but it can be can, done. i There's guess some... you can buy very expensive speakers that don't measure well so uh, you that is true yeah yeah uh, i certainly don't mean to apply that cheaper speakers are all cheaper speakers are bad. It's just that there are certain limits that when you're, when a manufacturer is working with a budget, they've got to pay overhead. You know, the retailers have got to make the money. Yeah. So you're not going to get a perfect, perfect speaker for you know, a little bit of money, no. but there's a lot of, there's a really lot of great stuff out there too, in terms of like yeah. the DIY driver world that you see that you could go buy. And if you built your own speaker, mm. you could do a lot with it. But when a manufacturer is building it, there's a hundred percent markup or two hundred percent markup because of, yeah. they got to make money. I can't I can't fault a company for wanting to make money. No, no, and it's also within one company or sometimes hit and miss. They have one cheap line which is good, and then go up one yeah the more expensive one, and that has issues. So yeah, yeah. that's very true. Well, cool. Um, well, hopefully everybody who is watching, if y'all don't mind, leave a comment. Let us know if there's any other content that you would like Renee to come on and, and talk about. Um, I certainly value your time. I appreciate you doing this. It's really, to me, it's, it's the kind of stuff that I, I wish I had when I was coming into it because just even seeing, if I'd seen the graphic, you know, with the antiphase and stuff like that 10 or 12 years ago, it would have just, it would have clicked so much easier. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that for us. Sure. No problem. Well, cool, man. Well, all right. Well, I'll let you get back to your wonderful day. And uh, I'll go ahead and end the stream. Bye, everybody. Bye.